So hi, my name is Tom O'Brien. I'm the chair of New Milford's Bike and Trail Committee. I'd like to ask the other members of the committee to stand up or raise their hands. Um, and also, if anybody's here uh, who is a past member of the committee, please do so. Because um, uh, this, what you're going to see is the effort of, result of two years of, of effort to get to the point where we actually have a plan to complete the long-held dream of creating a trail for walking and biking on, in New Milford. Um, one of the reasons we're having these public meetings is to listen to the public, uh, listen to their particular concerns, and what type of trail they would like to see. So um, I've been asked to, to ask um, like what type of group you might represent. Are there any um, runners here? Raise your hand. And somebody could count the hands. Um, Bill's doing that, right? Okay. All right. All right. Uh, so we want to make sure that nobody is forgotten about here. So. Um, I wish I could call myself a runner, but there's reasons I can't run, and I wish I could. It means I have to bring a bicycle wherever I go, which is a bummer. All right, we got everybody? How about people who would like to get out and walk and walk on trails? There's quite a few of those people here. Yes, I love walking on trails. I just, once I start running, things start breaking. So, we got everybody? All right, good counting. Um, is there any pet owners that like to take their dogs for a walk? If you've ever been to Sega Meadows, I will tell you the number one constituency there is dog walkers. It's a wonderful spot. So we got pet owners. Um, how about parents with young children that need to push them in strollers? Don't, or, or had to at one time. Because we want... Or grandparents. Anybody that pushes a little kid in a stroller. Because we want to make this trail as wheel and ADHD compliant as possible. Also people who use wheelchairs or anybody who needs um, extra assistance, with, that's what we're trying to do. All right, and are there any bike riders here? Don't be ashamed, you can admit that you're a bike rider, it's okay. All right, we do have some bike riders in our town. That's good to hear. Thank you. So uh, what we're, what we're, what we're asked, what the main thing we're gonna do is go through this study that we've come up with um, piece by piece. Um, and we're going to stop about three different, four different times uh, for some conversation, for some feedback. If you have a question while I'm talking, feel free to ask. Um, but I promise you, we will be stopping. We will be listening to your concerns. Um, but before we get to that, I want to give you a bit of an overview, because I assume there may be some people here who haven't heard of this project before. So um, what I'm going to do, forgive me, I'm going to give you a bit of a sales pitch at the beginning, why this is good for everybody. Um, and then I'm going to summarize what's been done so far, and then we're going to dive right into this study um, and go through that. We are, we are. Once we start, let's do that now. All right, go ahead and lower the lights. Does everybody need to find a chair still? Are we good? All right. And, all right. What, what I want to start with is reading the minutes from a past um, meeting of New Milford's town council. Um, and this regards a project that was called, that called Greenway 2000. So I'm just going to read a couple sentences. Don't worry, it's not going to go on forever. Greenway 2000 calls for developing a trail along the Housatonic River from Youngsfield Road to Helen Marks Park and building a canoe launch. The Greenway is envisioned eventually to extend from Gaylordsville to the Brookfield Line. So I'm going to ask, what, what, um, what year was the, when was this town council meeting? Let me hear some guesses. 1890. 1890. <laughs> Not quite that long ago. Any other guesses? Hmm? Pretty close. This was actually September 28th, 1999. The reason I read, I read that is because I don't want you to get the assumption that, that this was a crazy idea dreamed up by just a few of us you know, naive people. This has been a long-held dream in New Milford uh, for, for long before that even. I actually moved here in 1999, and my son was one year old, and I got excited, read about this in the paper, and I thought, oh, he's going to be able to ride his bike to school and everything else. <laughs> he'll, be, he'll be 21 years old in a, in a couple months. So it's a slow-moving process, and the project we're going to show to you is also a long-range process. We don't expect it built right away, but we want to just keep the dream alive. Okay. So having said that, um, let's start in on the presentation. So what is the New Milford River Trail? It's a plan to create a multi-use trail 
that follows the, the rivers, the Housatonic and Still River, the full length of time, from Gaylordsville to Brookfield. And the reason, one of the reasons I asked for, you know, what, who's a walker, who's a biker, and all, sometimes these get called a bike trail, and that's not really fair. This is for anybody who wants to get outside. So these are the benefits that we believe this trail will bring. Passive recreation, health and safety, and economic development. And this may be not immediately apparent, so I want to spend just a little bit on economic development because this is really crucial for small towns like ours. So I want to take a look at two of neighboring communities that have benefited from this type of trail. Does anybody know where that is? Who said Collinsville? That's right. This is the Farmington River Trail in Collinsville, Connecticut. Um, that's the ruins of the Collins Axe Factory, which closed years ago and everything moved to Asia. That town is really down on its luck. They're actually, the, those buildings are still vacant, but the town has been revived because of this trail. The other thing I want to point out, when I say, let's not call it a bike trail, if you look at here, how many bike riders do you see? I see two. There might be somebody in the back, too. Um, everybody else is walking, and there's always a dog. That's what you see on these trails. Way more people on foot than on bikes. This is truly for everybody. So here's the economic development part. Ten years ago, Collinsville was essentially deserted. This old market was pretty much empty. And um, now it's an upscale market with an outdoor seating area. Um, directly across the street is a wine bar. Around the corner is a British pub. And across the street is a, is a music hall that brings in like national acts. So Collinsville has been revived. Closer to home, has anybody visited the Harlem Valley Rail Trail? Anybody? So, so has any New Milford person Gone to, New, gone to Millerton and spent their money eating in the restaurants in Millerton. Oh, yeah. All right. We want you spending money in downtown New Milford. That's why we want to build this trail. All right. But here, so there you go. This is a typical summer. This was last summer, a typical afternoon, uh, right at the end of the trail in downtown Millerton. And I've, I've been there many times, but this was the first time I noticed that the diner had added outdoor seating. They never had outdoor seating before. Now they have outdoor seating. So that's economic development. All right. Uh, all right. I, I'm only going to give you one lame, uh, boring statistic on economic development. But I think this is real important. This is a study that was done on the um, Erie Canalway Trail, which runs through upstate New York from Albany to Buffalo. I grew up in Syracuse, New York. And that whole area is a real rust belt. It's really on hard times. This trail is one of the economic engines that's turning that area around. So just to show you, it's also a work in progress. It's three quarters complete, still draws 1.6 million visitors a year. What that means a work in progress, there's still gaps. So if somebody's on a bike, they hit a place where the trail just ends and they got a detour, go onto a road. Other places where the trail sort of peters down to almost nothing, but it still attracts 1.6 million, million people. So just quickly, $253 million in sales that wouldn't have happened, 3,400 jobs, $78 million in wages, and this big one here, $28.5 million in taxes. Most of those are paid for people who don't live there. So you, know, you may be worried that this project we're promoting is going to raise your taxes. I, I'm going to argue that if we do it right, it lowers your taxes. So keep an open mind here. Um, other thing I want to point out before we move on is local spend, about 26 bucks per visit, overnight visitors. Basically, tourists spend 530 bucks on average. That's because they stay in motels. That's because they have money to spend. They, they eat in restaurants. And in a minute, I'm going to talk about the fact that our trail has tremendous tourist potential itself. So move on. But I want to show you this picture. Last summer, my wife and I uh, were in Rochester. We brought our bikes. We went for a ride uh, on the trail. And when you get to Newark, New York, um, sorry about these pictures. But hopefully you can see that the, the part of the Erie Canal Trail in Newark is little more than a dirt single track path. So the, tr the Erie Canal Trail, there's sections where it may go 10 miles, where it's beautifully paved, 10 foot wide. Other places, it narrows down to nothing, then it stops. It's a work in progress. But that didn't stop them from making this a priority. And they keep chipping away at it and improving it. So that's what I hope we can do, rather than looking and saying, well, this is a challenge. Let's not do it until we figure that out. So even there, you know, we rode that little single track, and it was great. So this is what give, right here gives us tourism potential. What we're going to talk about today is 13 miles long, fairly small trail, wonderful 
uh, recreational um, facility for us. Um, not quite long enough to draw tourists from miles around. However, we were part of a much bigger operation called the Western New England Greenway. So when I started leading this effort, I looked around and started learning from other people and discovered uh, there, were, there were groups up and down the Route 7 corridor attempting to build off-road trails and safe bike routes. And we, we've been meeting together for, for eight years now. We have an annual meeting in Bennington. And from that, um, we created the Western New England Greenway, which is a plan to create a trail, a network of off-road trails and on-road bike routes that goes all the way from Norwalk uh, to the Canadian bo border. And by extension with the East Coast Greenway and the Route Vert, it, it connects New York City with Montreal. So this will bring tourism to our area. And just, just quickly, the, um, the CT1, 2, 3, and 4, those are the trails in Connecticut. One is the Norwalk River Valley Trail. Uh, two is Brookfield Still River Greenway. Three is us. And four is the Housatonic Covered Bridge Trail. So a lot of people in this area are doing the same thing that we're doing, and our efforts can only pay dividends for everything. And we have, um, we have maps um, around here of the Western New England Greenway route, such as it is at this time. And it's, it, they keep adding more dirt paths. Yes? So how are the other Connecticut trails doing on this project? Um, has anybody seen Brookfield Still River Greenway? Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. They, they had some success. Norwalk River Valley Trail. Um, um, there, most of their uh, success has been in Wilton. If you know where Orem's Diner is, walk across the street from there, and they've got a good mile and a half of really beautiful unpaved trail through, through swamp land with, with bridges and everything else. So it's slow progress, but it is progress. So um, all right, next. OK, so now uh, that, that was the pitch for why this is worth doing. I just want to let, for people who are new who don't know what we've been doing the last 10 years, I want to give you a sense that New Milford has created some, sec some parts. We have some success. So um, I'll start by saying, do you know, can you tell even with this big thing in the middle where we are right now? <laughs> Sega Meadows. Sega Meadows. All right, great. So six or seven years ago when I started leading this effort, nobody in town had any clue where Sega Meadows was unless they had kids that were Boy Scouts. It was a completely forgotten piece of town, absolutely beautiful. It's been completely restored, and the River Trail has had a lot to do with it. So that, we're very proud of this accomplishment. So thanks to Sega Meadows and to River Road, we actually have five usable miles of New Milford River Trail, which starts right at that gate. And actually, what I also love about this is this is supposedly not even a parking lot. I've seen eight cars somehow in there and still not blocking the gate because supposedly they'll tow you if you are. So people, this is, and there's another parking lot on the other side. This is popular. So yeah, so, we, so this is what we've accomplished. And with the town and two mayors and three mayors now, um, we have a 1.5 mile off-road trail that runs through Sega Meadows. We got 3.5 miles, which uses River Road to get to Gaylordsville. We have the Youngsfield River Walk, which was opened uh, a year and a half ago, maybe almost two years. And we have the third thing we've accomplished is this preliminary engineering plan that we'll talk about. So I'm going to force you to look at some pictures. I'm sorry about that, but this is the Sega Meadows Grand Opening in 2012, the trail. If, um, and that's what it looks like. Is there anybody that's not been to Sega Meadows yet? It's OK. You can be honest. That's fine. Um, your homework is to go visit that place this week. Uh, I think tomorrow is actually going to be a nice day, and then it's going to rain again. But it's a spectacularly beautiful place. And you know, it didn't, but neither of these cost the town really any money to do. A river road, we basically, uh, the advantage of the Sega Meadows Trail is it, the other end ended up on River Road, and it gave us another three and a half miles, essentially for free. Um, go back to there, because River Road, if you grew up in town, that had kind of a disreputable reputation. Um, a lot of people used to dump trash there and everything else. Um, you, if you haven't been there in a while, I mean, just look at that picture. It's spectacular. And, and it makes me very happy. Whenever I'm down there, I see more people running, riding bikes, walking, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. So River Road takes us to Gaylordsville. Um, and the, um, the map that you see of the Western New England Greenway, their current route includes um, what is that, Browns Forge Road that goes in front of Mer Merwinsville Hotel and continues on to Kent. So that's our connection and the hotel. All right, Young's Field. Does anybody even remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah? So 
if somebody was visiting here from another town, I mean, that's not the greatest, clearest picture, but would you even know there was a river back there? I mean, there actually is some water there. And the Veterans Bridge completely gone. That's what it looked like in August of 2016. That's what it looked like last summer. So a very short length of trail, but a complete um, rejuvenation of our downtown riverfront. And that's, that's the other little chunk of the trail. So what we're going to show you today, um, the study that you see aims at connecting that two-mile gap between that point and Sega Meadows, and then running six miles to Brookfield Town Line. And in Brookfield, we're hoping to connect with the Still River Greenway. And they actually have a committee meeting. Um, I've gone to two of their meetings. Lisa Arison, there you are, has, gone, has met with them as well. They're very excited about meeting up with us, like the Transcontinental Railroad kind of thing. So, next. All right, so uh, the third thing that we've accomplished is um, we were able to hire uh, the planning firm of Maloney McBroom uh, to study those two gaps that I'm talking about, the eight uncompleted miles of the New Milford River Trail. And th this is one of their site visits. They didn't just kind of look at computers and sit in their offices. They got out there. They walked every length of the, most, every length of the potential of the trail, uh, most of the time with members of the Bike and Trail Committee. Um, that's Seamus McKeon right there, who's here someplace, right there. Um, Seamus actually, not only did we do multiple walking tours, Seamus actually got a whole bunch of boats, kayaks together, and they, they all took a paddling trip the length of the river to actually see it from there. So a lot of effort was put into um, determining where this trail could go. And this picture was actually taken at the mouth of the Still River. That's the Still River where it runs into the Housatonic. And we're hoping to have a bridge to include the trail there, which would link the trail with Lover's Leap Park. All right, next. Hmm? Oh, Dan Stanton. I think I saw Dan Stanton, town engineer. Yeah, in the back. So Dan also is incredibly helpful with this project. All right, next slide. All right, so before we get into the study, I, a couple points I want to make. Uh, number one, this is a long-term conceptual plan. Um, nothing is ready to be built yet. Um, a lot of time to talk about this and figure out what we want to do. Let's go back to the, the phases if we can. All right, so I'm going to take you through. It's, it's broken down into 11 phases, um, which basically uh, look at pieces that are likely to be built uh, one at a time, also that are differentiated by challenges or by funding opportunities. So there's 11 different pieces we're going to talk about. Um, they're organized from 1 at the north end to 11 here. Uh, but that's just um, geographically for convenience. It's not to imply that we plan to build this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like that. No trail has ever been built that way. And even the successful ones, like the Milliton Trail, you may not know this, but you think the trail ends in Milliton. It doesn't. It actually stops there. It picks up again in Co Copeg Falls, three miles north of there, and goes on for a few more miles. They've been trying to solve a problem of the gap between Millerton and Copeg Falls for 15 years. So, you know, th these are issues that you deal with. So you, you, you build them as they become available, and you keep chipping away at them. All right, next. And each phase, if the town wants to choose to build one of these phases, it would require public input like this. Um, and detailed engineering before it could become shovel rating and also have to be funded so that you know, the town would have to go after the grants or whatever funding opportunities are out there. Um, and think about this just like every road that gets repaved. You know, there's public meetings, there's back and forth, notices in the paper. It's going to be the same with this project. Um, and I do want to assure everybody, because uh, you know, everybody has their own thoughts and that's why we're here, but this study did uh, consider uh, multiple options for doing this both sides of the river. Um, this is what we see right now as the best option, but we're here to listen, so moving on. And our goal is for this trail to run off-road and along the river as much as possible, but you will see that, that didn't, that's not how it's turned out. There's some places when it's too much of a challenge, it's too much uh, engineering required, so there's some on-road portions um, all of that. But that was the goal, off-road. And here's the big thing I want to put. This is not, we're not asking for local tax money to pay this. This is not dependent on local money. Most of these trails, Brookfield's trail, it cost them $2,400,000. Um, the vast majority of that was paid for by a federal transportation enhancement grant. 
All right, they, had to, they had to make a 20% match to do that. And there's nobody in Brookfield that will say that was a bad investment. Everybody, every single person favors that. So, this is not, so you'll hear big money, but this is not asking for local tax money to pay for it. And for example, we recently got, the town recently got uh, the recreational trails grant uh, in the amount of $180,000 that um, will go for further study of this trail. So this, this study enables us to go after funding for this trail. Without this, we wouldn't have even gotten that grant. So, all right, so we're going to move on. So here's, so there's 11 phases. Um, I'm not going to, you know, go into here. I'm just going to take them one at a time. But essentially, we're going to start right there on Boardman Road, and we're going to proceed south and quickly describe them. And after phase four, I'm going to stop and uh, let you guys and ask for some questions and comments. However, if you do, if a question comes up during before then, feel free. It's fine, no problem. All right. So the first section, um, the Maddenstill portion. This is one mile long. It starts just across the river here from um, Sega Meadows Park. And it runs between the railroad, close to the river, to the other side of the Madden Still uh, complex. And there's a few pictures. And next slide. Uh, the only big engine, the, the one engineering challenge here is if, if you were to stand on the, the new Boardman Bridge and look south, you'll see the land, at least at first, slopes pretty quickly. It levels out very quickly, a couple hundred feet. Uh, but we would need a retaining wall right there. So artist conception, uh, that's what they have. Retaining wall here, paved trail, um, heading down there, um, where the land flattens out, and then it just becomes a simple road. All right, next one. And that's what it looks like. And, um, and one thing I really want to emphasize, Sega Meadows, if you think Sega Meadows is beautiful, we got six other places around here that are just as beautiful as Sega Meadows. Our, our Riverside land, we are so lucky to have this. So the land here is spectacular. Um, there's giant sycamore trees that are at least two or three feet in diameter that are still standing here. So the road would go through here. The small trees uh, would be removed, but the, you know, the impressive ones would stay. Here's an artist's conception. Um, you know, it's a mile marker. Um, and here is an interpretive nature sign, which um, uh, you know, educates people on you know, the waterfowl, the fish, um, and the history of the area as well. So um, great opportunities for learning science, history, everything else. So, um, so that's the first part. Then we get phase two, we get to the, the first big engineering challenge, um, which is just south of Medinstill, right across from the power plant, that narrow section where the river is right up against the bank and the railroad is over there. Um, engineering terms, that's a pinch point or a choke point. There's not room to fit a trail in there. So the, th the thinking is uh, we're going to build a bridge over here. So here's the artist's conception. Um, and it might be a little bit more narrow than the other trail, uh, but a bridge for walking and biking along there with the, with the rail. So does this look like crazy ambitious? Feel free to, you know, yes. I mean, no. What? no. OK, I hear no. I mean, but I expect somebody will think, you know, this is, you know, this is pie in the sky. So I want to show you. Um, it ha don't show the next one yet, but it has been done, all right? Um, go ahead. So um, does anybody know where this is? Collinsville. Collinsville, somebody said. Yeah, it's not California, it's not Colorado, it's not Amsterdam. This is Collinsville, the same place we showed you the other part of the trail. Uh, this is a pinch point that they had. Farmington River's here, Route 179 is here. Um, they built a bridge to bring the trail past their pinch point. Um, and also, just to let you know how long I've been leading this effort, that little guy in that picture, um, that's the guy that's going to be 21 years old at the end of March. So, um, and that's, that, that's been there for a while. It's been very successful. So Collinsville has solved that problem. We can do it, too. And that's part of, yeah. OK, from, after that, um, the trail takes advantage of the next most beautiful place in New Milford, which is Wanapi Island. Has anybody heard of Wanapi Island? A few people, very few. I expect very few people. Um, that's about three quarter mile long, actual island. If you were to stand on the side of the road across from what, what used to be the Brass Mill Center and look down, you, you might think it was just flooded floodplain. But it's actually an island that's dry most of the time, absolutely beautiful. And um, here's a picture that I took there. There's one of those sycamore trees I was talking about. It's got ridges, so there's high points and low points. So 
what, what we are calling for is a soft trail, a walking trail through there right now. But conceivably, in, you know, someday in the future, we could have boardwalks that would be just lovely. If, you go up, if anybody's up, been up to Burlington, Vermont, and taken their trail, gone north of Burlington, it's like boardwalks that go on for miles. It's, it's spectacular. So, um, and also, um, Wanapee Island, it's tough to, to visit. Yes? This is um, fairly close to the river, yeah. So this, Wanapee Island is between the Housatonic Avenue and the river. Right. Yes. So the trail is running right along the shore of the river? Probably a little bit in at this point, a little bit in from there, yeah. On the high point um, of one of the high ridges there is what but we, but we it's see. nowhere near the Housatonic Avenue? No. No, and we, we, have, we looked into that as well. And that didn't go over so well. So, um, so, um, and so, Wanapi Island is tough to visit in the summer because it gets all overgrown with pricker bushes. This time of year, like when it's cold, it, it's actually a great hike. And you know, I encourage anybody to go down and check it out. There's actually a pullover parking space across from the old brass mill where you can park. And you, if you look around, you can see a ramp that'll get you down there. So go down and take a walk down there, especially if it's a cold day where the ground is really hard. It's it's really beautiful. So we're, we're really hoping to be able to incorporate Wanapi Island in this trail. All right. Next one. All right. Fa so, so that basically a soft trail, an unpaved trail, gets us to the Young's Field River Walk, which is right there. Um, and I, I don't know if I mentioned, but the, the keys here is yellow uh, indicates the desire for a paved trail. Green shows an unpaved soft trail. Um, and reds show bridges and structures like that. So, um, so here, yeah, here we're paved. Um, we want to bring people downtown, as I said. So the plan right now is to cross Young's Field and um, create a trail um, along the edge of the ball fields, um, alongside the playground, the skate park, um, and then up close to where the stairs are right now. Uh, but because we want people with wheels to be able to use this, and that stairs is not wheel friendly. Um, we, it's calling for a switchback. Um, there'll be a low slope kind of a ramp, you know, a really beautiful kind of ramp that will get people up to Patriot's Way. And when we get Patriot's Way, we're going to do everything we can possible to insist that they go up to Bank Street and further and have lunch, have ice cream, have pizza, spend their money. All right, so downtown is crucial. And you saw what Millerton has benefited, Collinsville, we can benefit. Our downtown will be thriving because of this. So uh, downtown is an important destination. Uh, to go further south, though, what, you know, we, we um, skirt the edge of Patriot's Way, and we have uh, a crossing at West Street. And my understanding is, and it may be happening now, but the lights are being redone, so that there should be a new crossing. Um, much, and West Street is supposed to be fixed somehow. So what's going to be incorporated there is a pedestrian crossing so that pe people on foot or on bikes can get to West Street. So this is where we turn back into an on-road trail. All right, I mean. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. All right. The purpose of these meetings is to get input from people who are actually users of the trail, not whether or not the trail should be built or where it should be built. This is a strong man survey. One of the things you heard Tom mention is it's a mix of paid, unpaid, and we're sort of curious to know from users, people who actually going to spend time on the trail, if, how important <coughs> you could say speed versus cost versus quality is. And what I mean by that, speed means just get it built as quickly as possible. Um, cost means do it as cheaply as possible, and quality means, well, if we can get it done a little bit faster and a little bit cheaper by not paving it, is that acceptable? So. When you're walking, we saw a show of hands, mostly walkers, um, by far. When you're visiting some of these other trails that you visited, is an unpaved section a deal breaker for some of you? If you're out walking and all of a sudden you're on maybe some grass or some dirt path, single track that's not 10 feet wide to 3 feet wide, is there, and there's no wrong answer here, you're not going to be penalized if it is. But uh, is there anyone who sort of thinks, 
you know, if this is really going to work, it's got to be paid. Yeah. It depends greatly on what the actual surface is. Depends on the surface. <coughs> so in your mind, what's what's an unacceptable surface? In, in your experience of walking and hiking? Loose gravel. Loose gravel is unacceptable. Yes. You can't you push a wheelchair through it. Right. You can't, uh, you, you can't put, push a stroller through it. It's just awful. So you you uh, you walking whatever see if, if you're by yourself you don't care but for practical purposes like wheeled vehicles it doesn't work. Well, like there was some uh, loose gravel put on the uh, assisted uh, uh, handicap accessible okay. section of the AT up in. Mm. False coach? Yeah, it's in false coach. And, and it was just off. Okay. It, it, it just ruined me. Any other thoughts on so, <coughs> I remember when Secret Meadows was first improved that it was pretty coarse gravel, and I think gravel like that over time will start to fill in and smooth out a part of the path. And <coughs> like, I know that I haven't even gone through my property that the sewer commission put through and they put gravel down and eventually it ruins the lawn. It seems like you know, like a mixed media, crushed stone that's not meant to look good like gravel, but that will compact and become a and hard pack grass trail it works pretty well. And it works. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, as a runner, I feel like any of these would be fine. But as a parent who's pushed strollers, there's lots of friends with strollers and you with the gentleman in the back very similar to wheels, so I don't know that the whole trail would need to have, or all 11 sections would need to have that same surface, but they would need to have several connecting links. Right. So that, like, for example, near the playground, I would hope to see several of the links connecting to that be hard surface. So we for wheelchairs. Would it be safe to say that a hard surface is more important in the areas around town, and as you go out to the hinterlands, it becomes that's important, right? As a, as a biker, um, having, having loose gravel is not great. Not good if you're on a road bike. Yeah. Skinny tire bikes don't like gravel. Yeah. Well, if they're not going to have a paved road, yeah. how is it going to be maintained? You know, if it's not going to be gravel, which I also would think it should be, you need to make sure that it's maintained. So that's a really good point about if you missed it, it's about if you're not going to do it paved, it's got to be maintained. As you know, the Appalachian Trail is largely maintained by volunteers. Just curious, and again, there's no wrong answer, but if there were unpaved sections, gravel or grass or whatever, soft surface, you know, do you see yourself becoming involved in volunteer committees to periodically go out and do that kind of maintenance. Um, I mean, is that something that the people in this audience could see themselves doing? It doesn't matter if you show a hand, who would be interested in doing it. I mean, even myself, like I ride on St. Louis with my bike, how many occasions I've gotten off my bike, and I've moved trees after storms. Right. I've messaged you many times for down trees, you know, knowing that I'm probably the first person there the next morning. You know, so that if by the next day I come back and they can have a little boom. So I can definitely say for myself, you know, as someone who uses such trails, that like going out there and doing a little bit of extra effort is important. The soft surface making is true. Yeah. I think one way you could work it out is if where you have, and someone may have been sure there's kind of parts here on the side of the road. Okay. But basically, if you have a soft or a gravel surface, which is really difficult for doing with an on-road bike, yeah. you have to then find an alternative route, and that may be a way that you can do the trail faster and longer. Initially, by having soft surface in some areas, whether it's far from town or the beginning, your idea is you want people to use that whole trail to be able to get down to the back of their homes. If you have an alternative route for that section that's paid, it would be okay. Otherwise, like right now at City Meadows, you have to go around your road basically if you have an on-road bike to yeah. get to River Road. And that's really, that's, that's not. No, I'm going to come back to that in a second. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 
Actually, uh, you know, I was thinking when I was looking at the plan, personally, I'd like to see less paved uh, because to me, the more natural surrounding, I mean, Sega Meadow, I think works for a lot of different uh, types of, of transportation, running uh, bikes as well. And to me, uh, you know, for New Milford, our natural beauty is part of this town. And you know, I look at Brookfield, and I'm sure that works well for them, but personally, I wouldn't like to see that uh, big paved trail through this whole thing. I would like to see you know, our footprint, again, Sega Meadows, I think is great. We, we left a small footprint there, and it's, and it's beautiful to go through. Yeah, it's far away from uh, the urban area, it's beautiful to watch a little more unpaved road. Uh, there's a reason why for instance, Minnesota, especially the Twin Cities, have hundreds of miles of bypass, and they're virtually all of them. Yeah. You know, there are 4,000 4, miles of, of uh, bicycle trails in Minnesota, and by far, you know, even in a rural area, they, they are. Uh, and so I think it's pretty good to that. And I think also, if people actually take a look at your plan, it shows that there are combination, especially to get away both in the southern end and the northern end, there's a combination of paint and unpaint uh, trails and nature trails. So I think it's important for people to really take a look at what's been done and what's been going up to see that there really is a combination. Um, and it does also separate projects from the uh, especially in the southern And just to let you know, anybody who left us our email address would be glad to uh, send you a link to the study, which is on the town website, so you can download it. <coughs> You can really pour so get back there. Yeah, um, I think that it has to have, if it's not paved, um, it has to have a very, very good underpinning. Um, there's a lot of dirt roads in New Milford which um, are a disaster every time it rains because they don't have that underpinning. And one of the things that I've noticed in areas where bikers use walking trails, running trails, if they're out when it's muddy, like the circumstances we have right now outside, uh, you have one bike goes through and you have a rut, which then is a disaster for all the people who follow. So I think in Minnesota, one of the issues is, you know, there's a lot of extreme weather from hot to cold. And another advantage of the pavement is that if you want to in the winter, you can plow it. You can go through and clear it off so that it is possible for bikers with the appropriate tires to use it even in snow. Um, and it's hard to do that when you've got the gravel. I want to make a comment about the, um, if I can, about another aspect sure. in this first floor. The <clears throat> um, area that's above the river. There are sections that I biked on trails out in Colorado that are uh, between I-70 and the Colorado River. They are low enough um, that every so often they flood. And so what if you do one like that here, it needs to be able to be flooded and not destroyed. Yes. Um, and that would be fine. Um, no, it's, a, it's a good point because if you're doing a river trail, Mm -hmm. It's going to flood. Yeah. And the, yeah. the question is, how much engineering do you put into getting it above flood, which in some cases could be impossible, or to your point, making sure it survives the flood, you yeah. know, so that when the waters recede, the trail is still because intact. A, a road had it to flood, if it floods, has to still be able to take a big truck. A bike trail doesn't, you know, there's a certain amount of weight, so you're not, you don't have the same engineering um, difficulty here. I did wonder when I was looking at the map of where the trail would be um, above the river, um, cantilevered out, whether you need to have a few places that have a little bit wider pull off. If somebody wants to stop and actually look at the river and other people still want to go by, <coughs> you should keep that in mind, mm -hmm. that it's not necessarily just to keep the narrow lanes. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. I just got more. Um, is there somebody in the back who has uh, a question? Yeah. yeah. 
So I'm in favor of gravel, uh, hard packed surface, uh, for, for a number of reasons. One of which I think it does a good job of maintaining the rural characteristic of the trail. And, and I use, I talked to a lot of people about this, but I use the Roxbury Trail, for example. And I don't know if anyone in the room has been to that trail, but that's the old uh, rail bed. Is that the one by the Blue Barns? Yes, sir. Yeah. Right there at 67 with the Blue Steep Rock. So, oh, Steep Rock. Has okay. anyone been there? Okay. So, so that was the old Chapak rail bed, which is a very good base. And they use the recycled um, chip sealing material for the top surface. And I visit that area quite often because I'm a flogger. And sometimes I use my bike to get to where I'm fishing. So I notice a lot of uh, young families are pushing strollers. I've seen some electric wheelchairs and it seems to serve its purpose very nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, but it maintains the rural characteristic of the surroundings. And so from my perspective, whenever possible, it would be great to see, and I think we've done that in this plan, uh, in areas where we don't have to pave necessarily, maybe it would be nice to, to do a surface like that and keep the asphalt sections maybe closer to town. And I think you hit the nail on the head because you have to think about this being next to the river, okay? When that river rises and it damages parts of this trail and you have to mitigate those damages, what are the costs associated with that? So, you know, we get a significant flood and I think we can all agree that we've had quite a few of them here in Center and Milford. And the asphalt get, gets ripped out, and that's going to be an exorbitant cost to replace that. So it may be less expensive, in my opinion, to maybe bring in some gravel and repair a couple areas of the trail. Um, the other thing that I think will serve as well from a gravel perspective or uh, a hard pack uh, aggregate is I think it's a little bit more environmentally friendly. So it's a pervious material. We're not depositing uh, as much material in it delineated wetland or a floodplain. And I think those things really should be considered because, you know, from a wetlands perspective, that's one of our number one enemies would be deposition of material in wetlands. So, so it's important to me that, though I, I support the trail, right, and, and, and outdoor recreation. Tom, I think you'll remember, you know, I've donated a lot of time and work to certain areas and parks in town. So, so I'm a big advocate of that. But I just, I just want to make sure that um, we do everything in our, uh, everything possible to try to make this as environmentally friendly as possible. Because I think that's really what makes our town a lot different than Absolutely. some of the surrounding towns. We have some really great environment. And a big part of this effort is to reconnect our town with the absolute most spectacular natural resource we have, which is the Housatonic River, which has been ignored for way too long. So I completely agree with you. Um, did, did, did somebody else have a question? Was Rob, did you have a question? OK, you good? I just, I just want to say something quick, because like, to a couple of people's points, it seems like the natural route that we've chosen all automatically kind of calls for the, the, the differences that people are asking for. It's like right around town, where you want to attract tourism, or you want to have people have good access to to walking. And we want to make it as ADA compliant. It's, 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 you know, it, it's natural to pave that area. Maybe pick District Road would be the other place that would be natural to pave because it's not right on the river. It's a flat yeah, we'll, we'll section, and it's connected yep. to right right here. Yep. Okay. Yeah, right. So a couple more questions. We'll move on. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. We're in South Dakota. There's 109 miles of trail. It's crushed stone. Mm -hmm. now, not a very large crushed stone, more like pea stone. And we you know that, and that on road bikes. On road bikes. On road bikes. I think probably 25 millimeter tires. Yeah. It wasn't a problem. It was hard to pack. And actually, it was in better shape than a lot of the asphalt fields around here. But they struck us that. And this was in South, 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 South Dakota. South Dakota. You probably still have it 20 miles an hour. Yeah. You know, yeah. Whatever they chose is a substrate that's as good as those. And if you, if you see some of these big trails like the CNO trail, um, the Katy Trail in, in um, Missouri, uh, the Great Allegheny Passage, these trails that are hugely popular, they're all unpaved just because they're very long, um, they're very successful. So there's no reason you can't do a successful unpaved 
unpaved trail. They're just not as useful to as, ver as wide variety of users. So we need to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, one more, and then and then we'll we'll take on a few more. Uh, uh, to follow up on the comment uh, made by Joe about these millings, these these uh, reconstituted stuff, if you roll that, it's almost like concrete. So you can achieve almost a surface that's like asphalt by using that material. Uh, I've done it and it works very well. And you could have a maintenance system where you go through the compacting roller to keep it that way. I have a different question. Okay. And that is, why did you not decide why did you decide to go on the east side of the river versus the west side of the river from Boardman Bridge down to uh, the town bridge? Tom? Um, because um, there is a huge number of private residential properties there, all the which we have to give easements. Well, my um, only point would be that the construction cost, I think, would be a lot, lot less. In other words, if you went across from where you are, you go across Boardman Bridge, the old bridge, yeah. and you go and you follow down. There's one place where a river comes, Rocky River comes through. But other than that, you have a pretty flat going. And all the way down to the bridge. Now, mm -hmm. if you went all the way down to the bridge, you also have the walking path across the bridge. I think you, when you start dealing with crossings, it gets very expensive. So the question was, if anybody in here, why didn't we go from here? We're, we're actually, um, what we're talking about is traveling on the east side of the Housatonic River. Uh, the question was, why didn't we go on the west side of the river? And as I said, we looked at everything. Um, and especially when you get close to town, um, south of where the churches are, um, there's a residential development with a lot, a lot of houses in there. So it's, we considered it. Um, but... Um, at least at this stage, this is the plan we've come up with. Um, but, you know, and especially if you paddle the river like we have and you really look at that and you see how many people would have to be consulted and ask for an easement or something, it, it looked like a daunting task. So, hmm? I, well, okay, I'm biased, so I, I, I'm going to, you're going to hear my biases all day long today. So I, I, I think this side is spectacular. So, but yeah, we considered it and you know, this, this is just a conceptual plan. Maybe it'll get brought up again. So um, how much more do we want? Because we probably should press on. Could we? Could we press on? Yeah, so we're going to do, um, we're going to get you down to the river because when we talk about the bridge, you're going to have big questions about that. I know. It's, heads will explode. So then, then you can let me have it when we get to that. Yeah. Yes, James. One point I'd just like to make. Um, we also did, as part of this preliminary group study, an archaeological study done fairly yes. extensive so that there's tremendous educational value, both historical, environmental, kinds of things that you know, we obviously would want to capitalize. Yes, and that tends to be on, at least at this point, on the east side of the river as well. Um, but you know, nothing is set in stone. That's the whole point. This is just keeping the dream alive. It's all we're going to do. So if we can move on, we're going to, we got you to West Street, and this is where it, we, it becomes the first on-road section. Again, um, we don't want to disturb, us, ask for easements, you know, ruin people's days by telling that we might want to make a trail go by. So um, this is the crossing at West Street. If you look at the, the side of the river here, it's a whole bunch of private homes, including I think there's one home or owner here at least. Um, so that made no sense. The other side uh, is, you know, it, that may seem to make sense, um, but it's real wet and it's real narrow. And you get over here to where the Brick House Pizza is, and they're right up against the wall, so uh, right up against the river. So what we decided to do, at least for this study, is just make an on road path for a half a mile down West Street. And this is where bike riders would use the street. Um, we'd have sharrows. Um, the, if you've seen, we have some sharrows in town. There's those arrows with a bicycle that, that educates drivers, the presence of bicyclists, and they show driver, bicyclists where they should ride. So um, there's some traffic calming there. Um, and the sidewalks, we hope, uh, will be improved. So pedestrians can use the sidewalks. Bike riders ride for a half a mile down this road. The other advantage to doing it this way is West Street, my understanding, and 
um, Mr. Stanton can correct me if I'm wrong, is that West Street is on a capital improvement um, budget at some point to be repaved. And when that gets done, it's a perfect time to include sidewalks and everything else. So this, this half mile section of our technical trail, you know, could get done just as part of normal town business. So yeah, so you have to put up with a half mile going down West Street. Um, go back one thing. And I'm sorry, that was my fault. Um, that's right. We okay. All right. It's kind of cantankerous. That's okay. It goes down a half mile to West Street, and then it turns into the next great hidden treasure of our um, Riverside land called Hidden Treasures Park. Has anybody heard of Hidden Treasures Park? Has anybody been there? I know Lisa. Lisa Arison was the chair of the now inert Hidden Treasures Committee but we really hope that this will become another town park. Um, and that's why there's a gate there and it says closed because it's not, it's town land, it's not technically a park, but we hope that will change. Oh, where, where is that entrance? Okay, this is um, across, um, this is West Street right here, and that entrance is directly across from the wastewater treatment plant. All right, you'll see this fence. Um, I think technically you're not supposed to trespass, but uh, there's a nice path that goes in there, and I would encourage <laughs> anybody I'm a big fan of trespassing, especially when it comes to planning a trail. So I encourage anybody to, to, anybody to go down. I, you know. It's also the portage around the bleacher dam, and the town has invested in making that portage pretty good. So, beautiful spot. So we got a half mile on road, then the trail turns into Hidden Treasures Park, and you can see there's, the road is already there. Um, it would need some grading. And actually, I believe Joe Quarenta has done a lot of work on this property, too. So thank you, Joe, for that. Um, but you can see, if this was a better picture, you can see that's the river right there. So let's, let's go back to the map now. You, you're there. This is perfect. So that's West Street, and that's the entrance to Hidden Treasures Park. So the trail takes you right down to the river. And what Seamus said, the portage for paddlers um, to, um, uh, to get around the Bleachery Dam um, is right here to here. So this is actually accessible to paddlers. Um, but our trail will come um, right through Hidden Treasures Park and it takes us to the river uh, where we have very ambitious plans to create two bridges that will get us to the other side of the river. Um, and I'm going to talk about the bridges and then we'll stop and I'll let you guys holler at me. Um, okay, so essentially this is the bleachery over here, and this is the historic bleachery power plant, which actually, I understand, is one of the earliest electrical generating plants in the country, maybe even the world. So it's a great historical feature that hopefully uh, will be you know, restored or improved or become an educational facility. But um, as far as the trail goes, we get to this point here. There's a little island here at the end of the dam that was the power generation thing. Uh, we have one bridge that gets us to the island um, that is 175 feet long, another bridge to cross uh, the river above the bleachery dam, and you can see there's the dam, there's the dam, uh, that's 280 feet long, 260 feet long, that gets us to um, pick a district road, essentially. So this is a huge, ambitious, pie-in-the-sky kind of idea, right? Can't possibly. Has anybody ever done anything like this anywhere around here? Any ideas? Next slide. Wait a minute, Brookfield. Look at this. What did they do? Has anybody been to the Brookfield Still River Greenway? So this is their, this is part of their bridge that gets them across the Still River. And you can see, I, I, it's not the best thing, but um, this is during construction. There's a lady with her two dogs posing just to give you a sense of the scale. Um, that bridge is about 170 feet long, and that's only part of the bridge. But um, this was a um, precast structure that was delivered in three pieces uh, that were bolted together on site and set on these pilings right here. Um, but that's only like one third of what it took for them to get across the Still River. Next slide. If you've been there, you know there's these amazing boardwalk ramps that lead you up to the bridge on both sides. So it's an incredibly ambitious structure. And I think if Brookfield can do it, you know, come on, you know, let's not sell ourselves short here, okay? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, we're not going to let them make us look bad. So, all right. So, next slide. 
Um, so m maybe we'll pause here and let you guys vent about the bridge or about um, hidden treasures or West Street. You know, any questions, um, uh, comments? Um, Oh, we've got Helen um, in front. Uh, so this bridge that would cross the river, would it allow boats to go underneath? Yes. Okay. Yes. So what will be the height of the river? I think in the, in the plan, I think it actually does say it. It's not in this plan. Are you talking yeah. about kayaks and rowboats? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. But actually, it goes above the dam. So the only people, even if it was low, the only people that might complain about it are the people like Seamus are able to shoot the dam, you know, when it's high and just ride over it. He tried to get me to do that once. So, but yeah, so it goes over the dam, so it doesn't interfere that part of the track. Um, yeah, in front, I think maybe. Um, yep, yeah, I know from the report uh, you looked at other uh, ways around this, and I would like to understand better why we don't stay on the other side of the river. And I know there's challenges there, but to me, that's the more natural side to spend two million dollars on a bridge to go through an industrial district. Doesn't seem to me to be in keeping with a, a nature trail. So the other side, you mean the Route Seven side? No. 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 Stay, stay. Yeah, along Grove Street. Okay. Grove Street. Down, come yes. down by Lovers. A lot of people doesn't trust appropriation for Grove Street. So essentially, instead of crossing the river, we wouldn't cross the river. Um, let's see. Um, now you can go back um, right here. So um, actually, yeah, right here is fine because um, this is Grove Street right here. So there have been um, discussions over the years of trying. So if, if the trail came down to the bleachery right here, it could actually use Anderson Avenue and cross the tracks to get over to Grove Street and then somehow follow Grove Street. Now, um, every one of us on the committee has spent a lot of time on Grove Street. I mean, I, I do a lot of bike riding, and, and every time I go down Grove Street, I try to imagine how we could put a trail here. And we gave Bill a tour. Um, this is Bill Baker, if you don't know him, who's on our uh, committee. And Bill took a tour about a month ago. And um, again, we, with open minds, we try to look at how can you make a, a true multi-use trail? How can you shoe that in, horn in on Grove Street? And it makes that, um, to me, it makes that um, choke point on Housatonic Avenue look simple in comparison but you know um but so i urge you like if you really think grocery is a great idea like walk Grove street and take some time and look at all the property look at both sides look at how close it is to the river i mean it really is a pinch point the whole way but you know i could be wrong yes Greg. So, i agree i think it should be on the road uh, uh, but i'm not sure it's up to us i didn't hear it i would ask that someone else i need to hear is that possibility so that we can look at it Engineer what about the growth? Yeah, like oh, how, okay. how, how do you how do you how do you do that? Do a do a study on the growth tree, yeah, sort of growth street alternative, right? And see what it costs and what's involved. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then and then and then people can decide what's the most appropriate way. Right now it's only an engineer, so I'd like to see it on the side. Yes. I'd like to see it. So and have you actually stuff and I don't mean to do this, but have you actually like slowly like walked Grove Street and looked at all the property and kind I of imagined it? Agree. Oh, okay. Sure. There's difficulties there. Okay. Um, I'm just I'm just saying that you know it's fine. Again, that's not I'm not an engineer. Got it. Engineers need to look at that. Okay. Um, I think we had a lady in the back. Um, Jeremy, how do you have that question? Um, yeah. on um, West Street, if they're going to be doing over the road and the sidewalks. Is there any way to also include a bike lane as opposed to having the bike lane in the road? I, I, I say that again. Since they're going to be redoing West Street yes. with paving and putting in new sidewalks, is there any way to get a right of way to put in an actual it's bike path, a separate bike, bike, bike path, as opposed to having the having it in the road? Yeah. So the question is whether going back to West Street, where's the one area so far that is actually on road for bicyclists, whether there's actually room to create a, a separate bike lane. And I, I think the answer is probably not um, with the existing sidewalks where they are and everything else. So it would be a shared use kind of thing. Um, otherwise, you're pushing into people's property, and they don't like that too much. Aren't there a lot of uh, houses, private properties that would be just minor and then you just have to do it? If, if you had to, yes, there sure are. 
I think, um, Tom, for you? Yeah. Um, the reason I would be a little bit above and beyond the fact that it's probably more difficult to build on the Grove Street side, I actually kind of like the concept of the trail going through the manufacturing section and near the shopping center. So if somebody really wanted to, you know, like maybe live downtown and bike to work or you know, possibly at one of the manufacturing plants or bike to Kohl's or something like that, they'd be able to do that without having to hop in their car. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to me, it's not just a nature trail. It's a way to connect living and going to work and shopping Absolutely. in other places other than just downtown. Yeah, that was gonna be one of my questions. Are there any people who are oh, on would, who would commute on a trail like this? Like if this thing existed from Gaylordsville to Brookfield or whatever form, would it be primarily, let's show it hands, primarily rec recreational? How about actual utility commuting? Shopping. Oh, the, yeah, the commuting or shopping or something other than just a, a stroll. Yeah, and I'm actually going to talk about that later. Um, yeah, I, I want to agree with you um, on uh, having the trail cross the river. Um, not because Grove Street's an unattractive, it certainly would put the right along the river, but connecting both to this facility, which is our community center at this point, and provides uh, walking, biking access from downtown and other areas, and also to the shopping on Route 7. And, uh, you know, I live in downtown and I walk everywhere that I can. And um, you may not be aware, but there are people uh, who walk from downtown to work on Route 7 now, and it is a dreadful walk. And to be able to provide a safer passage for people that don't have cars and rely on walking to get to their um, post services shopping, but also to employment, I think is a wonderful asset of this trail. So if we're going to keep recreation, as part of this, that, that I think it's very important to cross the river. If you're stuck on Grove Street on the other side of the river, you cannot bike over to the soccer fields and the baseball fields. Um, okay, a couple more. Uh, no, I, you know, as, as the comments come up uh, about which side of the river, I actually think it's better, again, the on the west side of the river. Because, you know, it's very interesting. One of the problems with Route 7 is you certainly can't walk it. And you have a lot of stuff down there. So you can come in the back side along the river and provide access along there. I, I really think that the, the best thing to do, if you can, is to set it up so that the concept is accepted. In other words, you're going from Boardman Bridge south. But I don't know as I would tune my stuff on the layouts that you have. Because I think the way you've constructed it, it's a nightmare to construct. You're costing a lot of money, and you could have a trail that is more de minimis to begin with. You know whether it's whether it's to uh, refine stuff, the track. You get so that you can begin to use it. And I I just think that when I look at this, this layout that you have, I see it as a construction okay. I mean, all you have to do is look at the numbers. I think you're better off. It's just a little bit like what you did going north the board. You took advantage of whatever was there. You went up the River Road, you did that. I think it's much road. more real. So that you're not talking about a 10 year thing, you're talking about something that gives more immediate access and safety and tying to, the, to, to what's on both sides of the river. And then people can have, for example, you have this thing that you're talking about going up along the Young's Field up to the top. But you just got finished spending $400,000 doing a new sidewalk. I mean, you really don't need that. People can come off of these, off of the main trail access with your little spurs. Mm -hmm. So if you can do the downtown, you can go into the stuff on the west side of the river. Uh, I just think you got to find something that is cost effective and functional. And remember I'm pointing out these are individual segments. Yeah. Um, may, some of them may well get dropped, changed. That's why I'm Broke them down into segments and make them change. I think that's great. So, um, thank you. Um, Rob, and then maybe we can move on again. So, one, to someone's question earlier about West Street uh, getting a bike 
lane or path yeah. or something like that. And I live on West Street, but right. I'd be perfectly willing to give up my sidewalk if it was converted into a uh, uh, a bike lane. Can you talk all of your other neighbors into that? Especially, especially, <laughs> especially bring them along. Yeah, especially because also that people drive because they can use that as a shortcut to get yeah. to uh, Grove Street. People yeah. drive way too fast down the road, and you can't park on the road anyway. So narrowing the road, you can make the sidewalk a little wider, and turn it into a bike lane. Maybe not a bad idea. So there may be some traffic problems that could function that way. Um, but my last question or comment? Yes? Yes, I thought I said that. Yes, yes. Um, so um, actually, if, if we can move on to the next one, um, it may answer some of your um, questions about why we chose this side of the river, at least in terms of access to Route 7. So back up. All right. So just to refresh your minds, um, we have this big, giant, crazy bridge crossing here. Um, which gets us to Pickett District Road. And then it's a trail up to Pickett District Road, um, which would provide access to this community center, assuming it's still a community center. Um, from that point, um, the trail becomes what's known as a side path, which basically is still a full width multi use trail, but it runs alongside Pickett District for a little over a mile, somewhat like an over large sidewalk. Um, and People have questioned why didn't we stay close to the river the whole way, which is a really good question. Um, this is a compromise, um, partly for two reasons. Number one, Kimberly Clark, this is their property, they have been incredibly supportive of this project. However, they have significant manufacturing operations close to the river here, which make it a challenge to get past. And when we get south of there, right here, you can actually see the railroad tracks. Uh, that's a pinch point. Right up, and you can see that pinch point from Grove Street if you look over. It's three times as long as that pinch point um, on Housatonic Avenue. Um, it would be a, a, a really big engineering challenge. Um, maybe someday in the future we can do that. But um, our compromise um, was to create a side path along Pickett District Road uh, for a mile. So next picture. So here's looking at, that's Kimberly Clark right there. The other advantage to doing this, just like with West Street, um, my understanding is that Pickett District Road is also on the capital improvement plan to be repaved. And when that gets paved, it'd be like adding a big sidewalk to one side. So, so this is what it looks like uh, right now. Next picture, there's an artist's con conception of a side path running alongside Pickett District, separated with a grass strip. Um, but again, you know, not near as scenic, I admit, as going along the river, but extremely useful. And when people talk, who, who made that question of access to Route 7 and the services, this provides better access to Route 7 um, than either Grove Street or a trail that went along the river. So utilitarian concerns, we think, way out here. Um, next picture, I'm going to show you some more about that. Yeah, can you speak up so that we can? Um, I meet with them, I've met with them every year, like in, in the fall, um, just to keep them up to date. We haven't gotten deep into the weeds. Again, you know, I've been leading this effort for 10 years now, and we've got Sega Meadows and we've got the River Walk. So, you know, I'm hoping my grandchildren will get to experience this. So, you know, we're not diving into the weeds with Kimberly Clark, but every meeting we've had with them, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Kimberly Clark is one of the most environmentally friendly country, companies in the world. Um, they're regularly rated for um, their s support for non-motorized transportation. Um, one of their reasons for supporting it is so that their employees can get to work on bicycles or walk and get downtown. They're extremely supportive. We haven't gotten into the weeds as far as parking and stuff like that. Um, but it's, if this place was opened, it, this would be parking. Um, but so what I wanted to point out is, um, Actually, go back two slides because I want to show the one more to show the plan. Okay, so uh, what I showed you is this is Kimberly Clark here. This this is the path 
um, where it, the side path that follows Pickett District Road. Um, this is Dodd Road right here, which is a great access to Route 7. It takes you to Coles. It takes you to the most important place in town, which, which is what? Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin Donuts. Yes. Yes. I knew somebody would hollow that out. Yeah. And, and, and um, what's, real, what's pretty cool is the one place where uh, an actual sidewalk neck for, actually exists where you can walk or on a bike you can easily cross to get into Walmart, safe, uh, the stop and shop and all of that. So Dodd Road is a really good connection from here to Route 7 and over here on Pickett District is another connection. Both of which, by the way, in case you don't know, every one of these signal lights has a push button crossing even though nobody knows about them, they've never been striped, I keep asking for it. But you can push a button if you want to walk across Route 7 and you will get a green light. So this allows us to get people off of Route 7, get people to access Route 7, and you know, hopefully like people who, like me, who would rather walk or ride a bike than drive, th this makes it um, more possible to do this. So anyway, so, th so yeah, we have a side path along Pickett District Road, <clears throat> and it takes us as far as somebody mentioned the ball fields on Pickett District Road. That's where we've become a river trail again. It turns left right here. Um, that's okay, you can go down to that now, but I wanted to show up there. Um, yeah, this is good. So um, here's where the trail leaves Pickett District Road, and it turns right, basically the entrance to the Pickett District baseball fields. Has everybody had a kid here in Little League and know where those are? Um, and somebody else, and another reason I've been so passionate about this, this trail actually connects most of the athletic fields in our town. It goes right by the Nestle Fields, Young's Fields, Pickett District Fields. Um, and it, farther south, it makes it possible much easier for kids to get to the high school. So, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of connectivity here, a lot of transportation as well as recreation. But essentially, so this is what, this is what we're calling for happening here is it, accesses the ball fields, then it goes straight, it crosses the railroad, and it enters the next great hidden treasure of New Milford, which is the meadow that's owned by Sunny Valley Preserve, the Nature Conservancy. Does anybody know where that is? Has anybody seen that? A lot of people don't. If um, right across here, this is Grove Street, this is Hine Road, Hine Hill Road. If you look across from there, you see this meadow in the winter. In the summer, you can't see it. But it's three quarters of a mile long. It's an absolutely beautiful spot. And you know, we want to bring that, we want to bring more of this riverside land back to the people in this town to appreciate it. So the trail crosses here. And actually we met with the Nature Conservancy. They loved the idea. We originally had this idea to sort of loop the trail through there, but they actually hay this every year. And Wayne Woodard, the um, executive director, said, you know, we love your idea, but um, if you could just stay closer to um, the edge here so that it didn't interfere with the agriculture, we'd appreciate it. And that's, that's why we made that change for them. But essentially, it goes through Nature Conservancy property, uh, goes right up to the mouth of the Still River, right here. And if you saw that picture of Maloney McBroom's study, they were standing on the opposite bank. Um, and you see this is a bridge abutment. There used to be a railroad spur uh, that served the old um, factory that's in there, the Bridgeport Wood Finishing Company. So essentially, we have one fairly small bridge getting us across. And by doing that, the other great thing here is we've connected with Loversley Park. So we brought people into another just wonderful gem of New Milford. And, you know, Loversley has a big parking lot there. So people who come to visit Loversley Park can get on a bike or put on their running shoes and they can make it all the way downtown and have lunch downtown. So just terrific connectivity. Um, but just to explain these pictures here, when we get into Lover's Leap, uh, our trails diverge. So we have the main paved trail, um, you know, normal wide, multi-use trail. Uh, basically, it's following an existing roadway. Uh, it takes us to Still River Drive. And then we have a soft walking path um, that stays along the Housatonic River, goes through the ruins of the Bridgeport uh, factory, and underneath the, um, the modern Lover's Leap Bridge, and comes into Lover's Leap by the historic bridge. And then from there, as you know, you can cross the bridge, go up to Lover's Leap, and go over the hill into, into Bridgewater. So um, also terrific connectivity. What we see this is like a lineal park where we're just connecting all these gems and just this big, giant, um, you know, wonderful expression of New Milford's absolutely beautiful um, environment. 
So um, we may want to stop here, but essentially I'll just say uh, the plan calls for the trail to cross Still River Drive, have a crossing there, um, and then it enters, um, it turns on to the, the road that serves as the entrance to Harrybrook Park. It's called Frank's Lane. Um, but it, it doesn't actually enter Harrybrook Park. Um, go to the next slide, and then we'll stop there. Um, it turns on to the old, actually, yeah, OK, so we'll do this. Yeah, it's going to be the next one. But essentially, these are where the two things come back together. They go into Don Frank's Lane, and they turn on to the old Lanesville Bridge. So click to the next one. That's the old Lanesville Bridge, if you know where that is. Um, it's no longer um, open to vehicle traffic. Uh, but it's perfectly suitable for non-motorized transportation. Um, yeah, let's stop there, and we'll do one more um, screaming and yelling at me if you want to. So thoughts and yes, sir. Could we do that like at the end? Could I back up? If you remind me at the end, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I'm afraid we might get bogged down back there. But um, Bill, will you remind me? We, go, we, zero, we zero back in at the Wanapi Island Trail. OK. Um, so what we've talked about up to this point um, is uh, following Pickett District Road, um, turning on to the Nature Conservancy property <coughs> and a bridge into Lover's Leap Park and then skirting the edges of Harrybrook Park. Uh, any questions, concerns? Um, why is it a terrible idea? Just because you haven't really gotten into this, but you know, backing up to uh, into the Treasures Park, the bridge, mm -hmm. just say a few words. I mean, we did look at you know, the possibility of going along the railroad. And As a bridge? The railroad bridge. Mm -hmm. So, if you just oh sure. Um, so, when we're talking about crossing the railroad, the, the river. So, my my kind of dream all along is everybody familiar with the railroad trestle that crosses right there? Um, and right. I mean, hopefully we have passenger rail someday. But right now we have two trains, two slow moving trains, go south and north. I, I, yeah, yeah. So, I had this dream that we could attach a pedestrian bridge to the side of the railroad trestle, and it has been done before. Um, that was always my plan of how we crossed the river. Um, our Malone and McBroom um, didn't like the idea. They said, if you do that, you're taking on the railroad's responsibility. You're basically owning that bridge. Um, the railroad also didn't like that idea either. So nobody except me liked that idea. So we, uh, we went with the new bridge. Um, and the one thing I got to say about that new bridge, for all the costs, you know, we're hoping you know, the, the federal government will still support these projects and it'll be funded in that manner. But just imagine if all we did was build that bridge and fixed up, you know, and, and fixed up um, Hidden Treasures Park, do you, don't you think people would come from miles around to cross the river and, and see that? I mean, I think so. I think it'd be fabulous. So, and that's just one piece. But I think it's ambitious, but sometimes you got to dream big, I think. So. Anyway, so other questions um, in the back? Um, so is this uh, what you attack maybe first? Is this section along Pickett District and then the bridges? Is that kind of the direction of where money is going to go to just like start? This we part? have no idea. Like, yeah, right now there is no money other than that $180,000 planning money that is available. Um, all of this is just a dream. And it's, again, it's just keeping the dream alive because when I read about this thing in 1999, this grand Greenway 2000, nothing happened until the Sega Meadows project in 2012. So I don't want to see that happen again. I mean, I'm OK with people saying, you know, it's going to take a while, but let's, let's chip away at this thing. You know, let's not forget about it. That's all. So other questions? Want to move on? Press on? We good? All right. So, uh, we're actually almost done here. So we have made it to the edge of Harrybrook Park. Um, and the plan as it stands, um, basically, as I said, we, we use the entrance because that's a town road. So Harrybrook Park is a private foundation. So 
um, we, it's not like it's town property. So uh, what we've worked out with Harrybrook is we sort of skirt around the edge of their property. We use, um, uh, what did I call it, the Lanesville Bridge and take us over Lanesville Road and around the edge of Harrybrook and then they've given us permission to sort of um, use a piece of the edge of their property to get around their property. We're hoping to be able to use to skirt the edge of the Candlewood Valley Golf Club as well but there are no easements or anything like that at this point. It's just kind of a dream. Uh, but that gets us um, to Erickson Road. So next, next thing. And at this point, um, the, the trail splits up again. And what, what, what we've determined at this point is um, it becomes an on-road kind of bike route if bicyclists um, want to get off the trail and on the road. Um, Aldrich is also due for repaving, Eric, or I'm sorry, Erickson is due for repaving, Aldrich was redone, so there, there's an opportunity as well. But essentially what we have is an on-road bike route for bicyclists on Aldrich Road to Brookfield, and then we, have, we also have a more or less parallel side path, um, an unpaved side path um, that parallels Erickson and Aldrich um, and loops a lot around the Still River to Brookfield. So um, let's show that. So that's what the green, that green arrow shows the concept uh, for how that path would be. And you can see um, the Still River is a real kind of oxbow kind of river. It just turns all over the place. And it floods, we know that. So this path will flood and we'll have to be able to survive the flood. But um, the nice thing about this is it could be a volunteer project. You know, it could be a youth agency, it could be Boy Scouts uh, putting, putting in a single track path. And if you remember back to the picture I showed you of the Erie Canal, that's not a lot different from what this is going to be. And so, um, so yeah, that's, that's the, the plan um, at this point. So next slide. So here's a conception for that soft trail we're talking about. Um, you know, this is an existing look um, from Erickson Road at the, um, at the uh, Still River Valley. And there's an idea about that path. Like I said, that doesn't look, other than the fact that it's kind of swoopy, it doesn't look that much different from uh, that portion on the Erie Canal. All right. All right, so I want to summarize, because I know we, we went back and forth with a lot of concerns, especially cost and pieces and stuff. So I just want to leave one thing in your heads, and then we can, we can talk as long as you want. Um, so summarize, this is a long range. And the key is it's a conceptual plan. There's no, none of this are engineering as built or built shovel ready plans. This is just a concept, keeping the dream alive. And again, phase one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's just organized for ease to understand. It's, we don't assume it's going to be built one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Especially, you know, as I said, there's some on-road sections that could be done um, before others or concurrently. It's conceivable, you know, if this got, you know, real serious traction, um, I, you could conceive that one off-road section could be in design while one of these off-road sections could be, uh, could be in design through public works. So, uh, but that, that's what those numbers mean. Just because it's number two on the list doesn't mean it's the second thing that's going to get built. Um, and again, each phase, if the town decides to do any of these things, each one's going to require public input detailed engineering and a funding source before it ever, um, before, you know, a shovel ever hits the ground. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do want to assure you, you know, we're here to listen and, and we, we sure will, um, but we, we have considered others and this is what we as a group with um, Malone and McBroom concluded was the best possible long range plan. But it's a plan, it can change. So. Absolutely, especially if funding becomes available. If somebody says, you know, if you know somebody that says, I'll give you six million bucks to put it on Grove Street, I'm, I'm all in. I'm totally all in with Grove Street. So there we are. Um, and again, and also not dependent on local tax money. Um, it's just something I want you all to understand is that the Harlem Valley Trail, the Farmington Trail that runs, you know, um, Avon, Simsbury, Granby, um, that almost all the money was federal transportation enhancement money that paid for these local matches 
You know, sometimes it's a 20% local match. So there's some local money, but most of it is has been federal money that have built all these trails. And that, the same with Brookfield. So um, if we have a plan, we, our town has a grant writer. So with a plan, uh, we can be looking for grants. And there's a lot of different types of grants as well. Like a, there's the recreational trails grant, transportation enhancement funds. And there's also private foundation money. Norwalk, their trail have been done with a lot of private foundations. Now, they have the advantage of being pretty close to Greenwich and some hedge fund dollars. So I think that helps them more than us. But, um, but nobody on the Bike and Trail Committee is saying this is going to be paid for with local dollars. And th there's no funding at this point. This is just a plan, just trying to keep it alive. That's all. So, so uh, l let me take questions for this part, and then we'll go back to Juan at the island. Greg. All right, so could you back up one slide, please? You're saying it, but it's not printed on here. This project is not What would be true? So in other words, you would rather say product is not totally yeah, absolutely. dependent on Correct. because we will have some have to add like that 20% right. 20%. So, so it's just adding in that one word. Well, I, mean, I wouldn't use the word totally, that's for sure. No. Yeah. Right, um, it's not uh, totally. Uh, no, no, yeah. no, totally implies what like, you get a little bit. Um, very little local money. But okay, I see your point. Um, so um, Yes, it can. It can. Yes. So, I guess what I'm saying is, no. So, if, I'm going to be trying to be clear here. Nobody on the bike and trail committee is asking, is asking for local tax dollars to pay for this project. I'm saying that to you. I'm not asking for local tax dollars to pay for this project. Now, yeah, it, it could come up that a great thing comes up. And the town as a whole decides, you know, we, we sh if there's a 20% match, we should fund it this way. But we are not recommending local tax money paid for this project. Is that clear at least? I, you know, I heard you say that before, but I just, it's, it's, this, it seems a little misleading. Now. Okay. Well, most people, when they see the multi million dollar thing, they immediately assume tax money. And so no, that's what I was I can see the town having five million. Personally, I would support that, but I just I don't think that's enough. Okay. That's my point. Um, I'm not sure. I, maybe Jeff was was first. Okay. I don't I'm, I'm not sure. I just, uh, you know, do not forget, this town has an endowment fund called the, uh, the landfill fund that we are still collecting millions of dollars, in. and it is it is really for three uses, and of course one of those three is for public recreation. So I think it is completely accurate to say that it is not dependent on local tax money because of the amount of money that we continue to see coming in to that fund. Thank you. Um, in the back, there's going to have a chance. So first of all, I, I'd like to thank the committee. Uh, you all have done great work and past members. And <laughs> it, and it's great. I mean, you certainly brought a vision. Um, and, and, and I'm, you know, very supportive of this project. Uh, but I would just something that, in terms of the cost, and I think if we want to get uh, the support of the wider community on something like this, I think you mentioned earlier that the entire Brookfield project was 2.4 million. Yes, yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. And so when I look at this project, just phase seven, which is the bridge, which you compared to. The Brookfield Bridge, mm -hmm. seven and eight, uh, phase seven and eight here. Yeah, the cost is almost double of the entire. Brookfield well, um, so let me just understand that like that was the first phase of Brookfield's trail plan. So it's just under two miles long. So right. Just, just to put it. There's concept. just two and a half miles. Yeah. So, our, so they built two and a half miles, which the whole. Yeah, yeah, we've got a mile and a half here, which is double the cost of their two and a half. 
Phase Which seven and eight here is about a mile and a half. Which part? Phase seven and eight of our project is about. If I, I look at the tables on the project here. Is, is about a mile and a half. So okay. it's five million dollars. Right. And these are estimates. Just so yeah. You know, so it's. I think we've got to somehow rationalize. Okay. Uh, I don't know which one, I uh, should know which one seven they are, but uh, okay, seven and eight. Okay. Right. Oh, sure, yeah, the bridge, yeah. Yeah, so that, 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 that shows big, big, big. $3 million. Got it. Yep. yep. And then $2 million for, so that's double of the entire uh, Brookfield project. So we're actually hoping the Boy Scouts are built that bridge. Uh, <laughs> so that'll be the cost down a little bit. And, uh, well, they're very expensive Boy Scouts, though. And getting them insurance. <laughs> So thank you for that. Appreciate it. Joe, Joe, Joe. Uh, what percentage was the match ultimately that Brookfield did for that short mile section? I think the total was 2.4 million. What percentage of that was money that Brookfield had to put in? I think they put in a 20% match. And I think they bonded for that. Um, but they, go figure, Brookfield decided it was worth it. And you know, I, I met with, when they set up their committee, uh, Steve Dunn is their first selectman. When they set up their committee, they invited me to go down and you know, tell them what we've been doing and, and all that. And, and he said, you know, I was the biggest skeptic of this project. I thought it was a waste of money, and I'm saying I was completely wrong. This is the best thing our town has ever done. And if you go down there, you just see, I mean, what Brit here's the thing. Brookfield is trying to create a downtown out of nothing out of four gas stations. They're trying to create a downtown, and they built a trail on a river that didn't exist 20 years ago. It was actually moved when they built Super 7. So they essentially have, are building stuff from nothing. And my point is, we've got everything going for us here. An amazing, one of the most beautiful downtowns in all of New England, and one of the most beautiful rivers. Um, I, I think we should be um, taking advantage of what we have. So, um, yeah, so Bridgeport, uh, Brookfield, um, I think bonded for their 20% match. But what percentage of the users of that Brookfield trail? Thank you for asking that, Julie. That um, yeah, was. They did a, so basically they, I, I don't remember what the number of usage is, but in the first year the usage was like four times bigger than they had, they, they, they thought. And they, they surveyed the people that came by and it turned out 25% of the people that were surveyed walking, mostly walking, on Brookfield Trail, where do you think they, their zip code was? 06776, yes. So, yeah, tons of New Milford people want to walk and move out and get out into nature. And they're willing to travel to Milliton. They're willing to travel to Brookfield. So I, I want them spending money downtown. That's all. So I'm sorry, it was, uh, I think you were first in front there. About 2,000 people a weekend who go on the Brookfield Trail. 2,000 people a weekend. Yeah, it's pretty crowded. <laughs> and no complaints. The biggest problem they have, what's the biggest problem they have? Parking. 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 Yeah. Parking. You know you've got a successful trail when it's open for a week and they're complaining there's no place. And, 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 I, and I, yeah, and I know that. What? And plus, it's not complaining, it's an observation. It's not anything you can do about it. Mm -hmm. But it, it floods. Yeah, uh, underneath the Super 7, it floods. It floods a big time. They knew it would, Yeah, and it, and it, it survives. But yeah. They, but a tornado. Yeah, they, yeah, they tornado. did. The tornado decimated <laughs> it, but they, they got it cleaned up pretty quick. But quite. it didn't hit the bridge. It did didn't it, hit. Did anybody go down there when it was closed? But even the wooden part, the yeah. gas. Did anybody go down there while it was closed because yeah. 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 of the tornado? Yeah. I went down there about a month afterwards. It was totally closed. And paths had been created around every down the tree. <laughs> so it was closed, no trespassing, and people had figured out. So that's a good sign. Uh, in the back. Thanks, Tom. Sure, so sir. I'm glad you mentioned the trail popularity. So we want this to be popular. We want people to come from all over. I think it's important that your committee takes into consideration how that could potentially adversely affect private landowners, and, I, and I'm one of them, so, so my property is right there at the start of this phase <coughs> one. And without the trail being there now, just with Sega Meadows, as much as I love my community, uh, and everyone in this room, I think, would be responsible enough to pick up their trash and respect the area, people from outside of town don't always do that. So, you know, there's people parking in our driveway over there. Um, I had a family of four from New York pitched tent in my yard. And they thought they, they thought that you know my 
beautiful little side yard was part of Sega Meadows, and you know it's no big deal, right? But but you could just dig up their tent, right? So it may be, you just listen, get that one maybe listen, maybe I can sell all my equipment and just rent camping spaces. I'd love it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'd be a lot less strenuous on my body. But <clears throat> so I guess my suggestion to the committee moving forward is I just have a couple of um, I guess. Um, requests of you to look look into certain things so that would be one of them like how do we mitigate any kind of you know adverse effects on landowners around the trail people are going to come here they're going to need a place to park um where is that place um and, and and keep people i guess contained to the trail um and not you know wandering off on people's properties and you know playing in their yard and stuff like that so that's important um i'm working on trying to organize a town-wide trash cleanup. So that's kind of another thing I consider mm -hmm. with the, the trail. I mean, outside of the immediate maintenance of it, how are we combating that sort of thing? You know, uh, candy wrappers and bottles. I went to Brookfield today prior to the meeting just so I can get a good bearing on, on that. And it's beautiful, it was being used. But I picked up two trash bags, two 55 gallon trash bags of garbage that was on the trail. Yeah. Which was, you know, to me, kind of a bummer. So, like, um, yeah. so that's something that I would like you guys to consider how to. Sorry, how to I get, have two that. answers for you. That's a really good question. Um, this is the town's bike and trail committee. Um, th there's also a nonprofit, New Milford River Trail Association. A number of the members are here, and trail maintenance and cleanup has been an ongoing thing. And I, and I just want to say, as far as Sega Meadows goes, when I first started pushing on the, the Sega Meadows, and when it first got open, I would ride through there on one of my old bikes with a big trash bag on the back and it would take me an hour to get through because I was cleaning up beer cans. Nothing but beer cans in Sega Mountains, just cleaning up trash. And we actually, last year for um, Connecticut Trails Day, we organized a trail cleanup. And I know there's a couple people here who led that trail cleanup. Um, there was nothing to clean up. It's like all these people showed up to help with the cleanup and we're like, uh, this place is pretty clean. You know, so, so the more these things get popular, and, and what I found, and somebody said this today, um, about when trees fall down, like people just do it themselves. It's amazing. I used to feel like it was just me, and my son would come in there and we'd cut them up. And I was down there one time after a big storm, and this guy was walking by, pulling a cart with a chainsaw, and he just took care of it, and he chopped it all up and everything else. So, so I think there is a great volunteer spirit that is, will ever, do that or is doing that. If this has ever improved upon this original plan, maybe some of those details could be added in. No doubt. Track, trash location, parking. Yeah. Uh, any potential oh, and parking is included. Okay. Um, right. I, you know, there's only so much I can talk about. That's why I will send you links to the thing. There's a parking lot at South of Madden still included here. Um, we include, you know, hopefully this will be parking and some other places. But yeah, that has, this is all included. The amenities, you know, at this level, this is still sort of a 50 foot off the ground plan. So where a trash can would go, we didn't get into that. Yeah, so when you get to like 75 or 80 percent off the ground, mm -hmm. just consider that the trail sure. is going to go through quite a few industrial pieces yes. of property that we know have had environmental contaminants on. And so it would be my suggestion to the committee prior to if and when this thing is ever built, just do your very best to you know uh, research that if in fact there is the presence of any contamination, so we don't get in a situation where we're you know acquiring a piece of property over at Medinstill, which was formerly Nestle's, that we find out that well, hey, this was the maintenance facility's dumping ground for a hundred years. Good so, yeah. so I would add that to your uh, charge to Malone and McBroom. I think that's pretty important information. So, just some suggestions. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, anybody else? We good? Uh, in the back? What, uh, are, in the back first. what are some of the, uh, can you kind of walk us through some of the next steps to uh, get approvals for what's involved? Um, well, this plan, <coughs> this plan was adopted by town council, um, at least in, in, so, in, so that we can go after grants and stuff like that. So um, I, I, right now the next step, you know, is to build public support for this this project. Public um, support and public input. Like and this. public input, yeah. We're, and gonna, I, we're gonna try and do some surveys and some very sort of regular questions about usage. Uh, part of the charter of this committee, which is the second iteration of the committee, yep. is to solicit input, specific usage input from the public. Yep. Never mind taxes or you know just 
how would you use it, what would you like to see, what wouldn't you like to see, things like environmental concerns, how do you protect private property, those are important things. And I think we're going to try and get more granular on that by not only meetings like this, but possible tours for the public of the proposed group, which is very helpful for people who don't have a good video. You know, it's hard sometimes to visualize by looking at a slide presentation, and also like online surveys where people can, we can actually collect data and start um, really quantifying sentiments about specifics of what people would like and what people are concerned about. Um, it's a process though. Each, as each one of these sections, probably there'll be some prioritization based on funding availability, public input, uh, legal concerns and environmental considerations among others. And that will, I think, probably dictate a good portion of what happens next, which section and how. But if you support the concept, uh, let our town officials know that you support the concept. Um, I think there was a couple of people in the back first joined the tour. I, I think it was Robin that um, brought first. I'll just make a quick um, comment about like people asking what what uh, might be first or next. If, if, if you're choosing phases, it seems to me that if one of the big goals is to get more awareness of the trail and yes. make people from out of town aware that the downtown is connected to the river, it just seems like if if the Youngsfield portion is done sooner and done really well, so it's an attractive space and not just an accessible trail, and very clearly connected to Bank Street, it seems like that would just accelerate the awareness of mm -hmm. it. Right. Right, Mike. I also have possibly a question for Dan. The, if some of these roads like Pickett District are on the capital improvements list, wouldn't that be an obvious choice? To, if you're going to repave the road anyway, wouldn't you just add, I mean... Well, what, I think it comes down to the, the community's commitment to yeah. that. So these roads, obviously there's 53 miles. I'm Dan Stan, I'm the town engineer of and, um, helping this on and off over the last few years as I've been asked to be involved or so on and time permits. So, you know, our number one focus at Public Works is, is doing what, you know, the mayor's office and the town council allows us to do, which okay. is what the community generally wants, okay. correct? So I, I reiterate what Tom said, okay. and that it's important in the public input portion for to make that known that, that you're willing to support, you know, additional, let's say, amenities to the project you think about a road project, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, we're still very car centric. So paving yeah. the road is, is number one. Um, and you would add, you know, sidewalks and bike lanes yeah. and other items as, as funding. Okay. Yeah. So. It just seems that that is low hanging fruit. Like yes. if you're already going to fix that road and you know what's going to happen, what's the harm in adding a bike path along it? Right. It, it seems like it's, an obvious choice of something to, to just throw in there and yes. get it done. Yeah, good point. Uh, Tom, you already have one concrete direction with that great Connecticut Recreation Trail Grant, which is $170,000 for the state. And can you tell us a little bit about what that is aimed at doing and what it's intended on? And I think it's focused on the public trail. Yeah. Um, You know what, Nigel? Do you want to talk about that? What? Um, well, um, well, yeah. what I can tell you is that uh, our town grant writer applied for the Connecticut Recreational Trails Grant, which is through Connecticut Deep. She asked for um, enough money to cover a design of the first three sections, sections one, two, and three, phases one, two, and three. So, um, but she got enough money just to do the design of section one. So that's, um, that's Medinsville piece right. that's from Boardman Road to the entrance of Medinsville. Yeah. So right. assuming negotiations work out of easements, um, that would provide the money to design the trip. It would provide the money to build the trip. But it would provide the design so you have a set of blueprints ready to go whenever funding becomes available to build. Absolutely, absolutely. You've got to have a plan. That's why, you know, this this may need to be tweaked and need to be changed. 
but you need to have a plan or else you're not going anywhere. Um, I think, Jeff? Um, I wanted to thank Joe for especially bringing up the aspect of the environmental cleanup because we know that um, probably between uh, section four through two, we, we definitely have potential for um, for environmental cleanup. Uh, plus, with the riverfront revitalization, um, we have to move those uh, oil companies out, DPW might be moving, etc. Yeah. So there's a lot of issues to consider. Um, and that's a good point, because this really is very um, uh, closely connected with the riverfront revitalization plan. So uh, we sure hope that the Norfolk River Trail becomes a key ingredient with riverfront and revitalization. Well, as it, as so thank you for putting that As point. it should be. Yeah. Um, and as Brookfield continues to move forward with their trail, yeah. um, it probably would make sense to start at that base. Your stage is 11, uh, 10, and 9, etc. Et yes. Then to go at 1, 2, and 3, because you avoid the issues of environmental problems. And also, to your point, where they're going to be uh, repaving roads, they're going to be redoing Harrison Road, yeah. redoing Big District Road, etc. So we can hop on that real quick, and um, it will be less of all cost to the public, at least upon the um, <coughs> Just the projections that were done here by Maloney and Bruins. If you go from the Brookfield line just to Youngsville Road, that is 77 percent of the length of the track. Yeah, that's the big. That is 77 percent. And what's interesting about that is that that is only 60 percent of the faults. Hmm. Okay, so you spend more money on the last. Um, 23%, no, not the bridge, but um, in going north of Youngsville Road, which is a very short segment, than you would the far longer segment going mm -hmm. all the way to Brookfield. Right. And if we really want to piggyback on that and team up with Brookfield and get people interested, I think we should be looking at going from 11 backwards instead of going from 1 to 3. Mm -hmm. And that's why I made that point that those numbers don't imply anything other than the secrets I'm talking about. Um, we've all had that conversation. We're asking the town, we're asking yeah. the town uh, grant writer to go for those first three phases. Well, the reason that's, well, it doesn't it's make a sense. long conversation as to why that grant was applied for. Uh, but just the fact that we got money is a good thing, right? right. Um, but to your point, I, I agree with what you're saying. All of us on the committee have talked about this a lot. Uh, Brookfield is very excited about connection connecting with us. There's a lot of energy to connect with them. There's a lot of opportunities when towns partner up searching for grants or funding opportunities. There, there's more opportunities there. So we absolutely are looking that way too. Um, ultimately, it's on. we're just advisors. Ultimately, this is the mayor and the town council. So if you support this or if you have concerns, whatever, let them know how you feel. That's, re that's the most important thing that we can do. Uh, we, we will at some point, we presented this, if you guys were at the meeting, we made a presentation back in May. It was, uh, it was an enjoyable uh, experience. If anybody was there, it was, uh, there was fireworks and everything else. Uh, um, I don't know if it's negotiable. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. To Jeff's point, maybe it would be something you could suggest to the town council that if in fact that money could be used in other locations instead of just one two and three because i think he's got a very valid point that covers most of the asphalt portion of the trail mm -hmm. and it would just make better sense to maybe start down there so i don't know if that's something that's negotiable it might be a question i, I, I know it's ask. so i think the way the ground was written is sort of I see. Uh, specific uh, but um that again we're gonna if, if we're gonna do this we're going to chip away at this from a lot of different perspectives, like every other trail has. Um, and if, has anybody visited the Farmington Trail and ridden on them? So if, if you're coming up from Avon and you hit the BD&A Manufacturing Company, it's a rail trail. It's a dead straight rail trail. But you hit, you hit south of Simsbury, and the trail does this, does this, does this, and comes around. Because they wouldn't grant an easement, so they went around there. And then you get up, um, and you get you go through, you go south in Plainville, there's a complete gap because there's 
the one place that the railroad is still technically lives. So that, that's still a giant gap. But still, the Farmington Trail is the most successful trail in Connecticut, despite issues that they have. So just got to keep moving along, that's all. So uh, any other questions on the big picture? And we'll go over to Wanapee Island and answer that question. But you know, and I'll, I'll, we'll stay around and answer questions specifically if you want. So we had a question. Of, thank you. Thank you. So we had, before you leave, we had a question about Wanapi Island. Does anybody else want to, or did you just want to talk? Uh, well, I don't want to hold that. Okay. Thank you all very much. <laughs>